And so this project uh, and, and this topic is, is uh, social housing neighborhood renewal. So um, people from across the country uh, might have projects in their own neighborhoods or communities going on. Um, bigger projects in Ontario, of course, are uh, Regent Park and Alexander Park, and, and there's a few other names where we're seeing um, social housing uh, neighborhood regeneration happening, and, and it's actually happening in smaller communities now, such as Kingston. So I'm going to give you um, some background um, on the project and, and talk about some of the, uh, the where we're at and the lessons learned. So um, here's the questions we're uh, I'm hoping to, to address. Uh, why did the city pursue this initiative? What are the goals of the project? How was the initiative developed? What is the current status of the project and next steps? And what are the lessons learned? So um, we're going to step back now because uh, in order to understand the history, um, you have to know a bit about where the neighborhood came, some, came from. So very quickly, um, you can see downtown Kingston in the south uh, on Lake Ontario. Um, farther north, you can see Rideau Heights, and, and the dashed line is the uh, train line, and then there's the 401. So you can see it's uh, somewhat distant from our downtown area where a lot of the services and cultural amenities and commercial areas are. Um, uh, so the isolation has been a, a challenge in this neighborhood for some time. Um, so moving on then, um, you can see the, uh, I think I have a pointer here I'm going to try and use. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see this. But anyways, this is the train line here. And this is going back now, this aerial photo is 1943, uh, or sorry, 1950s actually. Um, and here's the 401 being built. Uh, there's a quarry right here that uh, aggregates are being used to, to, to construct the 401. The quarry is interesting because it becomes a, a key uh, piece of the neighborhood uh, down the road. But the area in uh, right in here um, and, and over here, this is uh, in the 40s it started out and um, into the later 50s and 60s there was 300 small homes, uh, shacks uh, is what, uh, uh, what we call them, uh, built in this area. Uh, they had electricity uh, but no water and they had outhouses. Um, so it was it was a place on the outside of the city where uh, building permitting uh, wasn't the same uh, level of, uh, of requirements and um, zoning wasn't wasn't applicable. So it was outside the city. So the, the farmers started selling off lots to low-income households, and they built structures uh, like these. So this was um, uh, there was about uh, like I said 300 of these uh, come the end of the 1950s. So. You can see uh, power going to that building. There's a number of children playing out front. So at the time, there was a, a, a sociological study of the neighborhood that preceded um, the social housing uh, first phase of development that, that I'll chat about shortly. So here's another shot uh, showing um, what, the, what the homes looked like in that area in through the uh, starting in the 40s and into the 50s and 60s. So pretty, pretty sparse, uh, meager living for sure. Um, uh, very much a fringe type of neighborhood where you can read some of the uh, some history, uh, lots of interesting history bits and pieces, but uh, police really didn't service this neighborhood. Uh, there was no transit uh, services, parks were undeveloped, uh, school was eventually developed, but so it was very much uh, an isolated community, um, lower income households trying to, to do the best they could with the resources they had. So um, by the 1960s, you can see some of the dates on these headlines were we're at the point where um, uh, governments have more funding. Urban renewal is, is an agenda of the day. So um, in Kingston, uh, this was very much identified as, as the uh, area of the city that needed some uh, reinvestment and renewal. So a lot of uh, community leaders at the time uh, representing uh, churches and, and counselors, those sorts of people, were talking about what can we do in Rideau Heights because um, there was uh, 300 homes um, but about uh, 1,500 people living there. So of those uh, buildings I was showing you, you know, we were talking about five people on average living in each of those. So uh, public uh, health concern for sure for the community. And with uh, rising affluence in Canada, uh, these types of communities um, were, were seen as something that needed to be addressed. So um, you can see here the headlines, of course, there was a plan developed. The idea was uh, to purchase back these lots from the homeowners, uh, and um, and then re-subdivide and bring in services to that area. The idea is that they'd sell then back a lot to the uh, the lower income households if, if they could purchase uh, and they could rebuild. But of course, that's a, a costly endeavor, and and then you'd be building at building code standards and, and those sorts of things. So that's of course why uh, why people were there in the first place to get around the cost of building 
um, more substantial housing. So um, the, the idea was developed that they'd include uh, a public housing component. So there was some uh, funding at the federal uh, level to build housing. So um, the idea was for those that can't repurchase and rebuild, we'll have a component of public housing as well. So uh, moving on then, um, here's uh, the sh two pictures in the top, of course, are groundbreakings, um, uh, lots of excitement, uh, new funding, um, houses are going to be built. Uh, the pictures down below, you can see that uh, those are the families, of course, moving in probably a year down the road. Um, everyone's uh, uh, got smiles on their face. And what's interesting is um, uh, over the successive phases, there was about 500 social housing units built in Rideau Heights. So that's that uh, isolated area of the city that I showed you on that aerial photo, that slide. So um, 500 units um, that were built uh, at quite a distance from uh, community services and, and, and daily sort of requirements, places of employment, those sorts of things. And of course, lower income households not having uh, individual cars. It, it was very much uh, an isolated community for sure. So, um, so moving on to Rideau Heights, uh, uh, today, um, some of the details. So it's approximately 2,000 people spread amongst 501 uh, rent geared income housing units. So um, for folks who are in, uh, familiar with social housing in, um, in in Kingston and particularly at these sites, it's 100% rent geared income. So we don't have that uh, mix, that social mix that makes uh, for good affordable housing communities. So that's what we're, we're trying to get towards and I'll speak about in a bit more. Um, there's buses and schools and there's some parks, but not very well programmed park spaces. So amongst the 500 units, um, about 75% of those are townhouse units. Here's some shots uh, on the ground, of course, in the summertime. Um, typical uh, public housing style development, limited uh, vehicle access, lots of um, pathways, walking paths, and uh, sort of hidden areas uh, that become security concerns um, and, and maintenance concerns. Um, so let's see yeah, a quick shot of some of the housing. Here's uh, some other areas of the neighborhood. So up in the top left, you can see that's the main park, Shannon Park, which is actually under uh, redevelopment right now. Um, on top right, you can see the Wally Elmer Community Center. So this was an arena that also served as a small community center uh, facility as well. Um, that was been demolished and we're actually constructing a new community center now that I'll show you, but um, an interesting piece of this, I guess a, less, a good lesson learned too that I don't have in the end, but um, this uh, arena that was uh, um, lacking uh, relative to modern standards, uh, the community really had rallied around. It was kind of a safe space where they understood uh, good things happened. And, and in the demolition of that, it was amazing because we were able to show pictures of this new facility that would, would come one day, but people were really connected to this. So that, that whole uh, sense of community and, and um, um, taking ownership for, for something like this, is, it's important. So we're wondering how can we recreate that in the, in the new world for folks. Um, so moving on then, um, uh, so, so I guess usually when I've done this presentation, uh, versions of it a fair bit, and usually uh, after we you know, get to this part, um, things, things seem pretty rosy, of course. A lot of public housing was built. Um, but uh, the, the final wave of that was in the mid-70s when, when we had the 500 units. And then um, you can see here in 1988, uh, it's the same buildings. You can see some renovation work took place. So by the 80s, so you're, you're not much more than a decade after it was built, um, the Kingston Housing Authority was reaching out to the province uh, and prepared a report talking about all the challenges in the neighborhood. So challenges uh, related to the quality of buildings um, and also extensive discussion of the social challenges in the neighborhood. So all the result of that concentration of, of very low income households. So um, at the time, the uh, focus of that report and the recommendations were if if we can improve the aesthetics of the neighborhood, we can maybe improve the, the quality of life and the behaviors and that sort of thing. So on the top picture in 1988, you can see uh, the roof lines are very um, uh, sort of uh, uh, institutional looking, um, not, not uh, reflective of, of the adjacent neighborhoods, which are, are more uh, traditional style. So funding was provided. And um, in, in the lower picture, you can see substantial changes to the roof lines occurred. And this was uh, regeneration uh, step or phase one in, in Rideau Heights. So unfortunately, we're at uh, 30 years later and 
all the the language and discussion of the challenges back in in the 1980s uh, is all is still prevalent. You could you could uh, read it all today, and it would sound like it was the uh, happening now because a lot of the same challenges are there. Um, and and you can imagine that these roofline retrofits that happened all over the neighborhood, huge costs associated with that. Um, but really, uh, was there much result uh, of that investment? So something to to keep in mind. Um, so so why did the city produce pursue this initiative. So aging housing stock, so um, the, the quality of housing, it's, it's known that at the time it was built quickly and um, the, the quality uh, piece was questionable. So we're, we're now down the road 30, 40 years for, for these units, 50 in some cases, and um, there's some challenges there. Lack of security and safety, so um, there's not a lot of vehic vehicular access to uh, the depth of the residential block, so it's a lot of pedestrian connections, which um, are great in in uh, in areas that have uh, good uh, surveillance and and sight lines, but um, when people aren't in areas that they can be seen from the street and and there's long expanses of unlit path pathways, it, it can become quite challenging. Unprogrammed park spaces, so the parks virtually weren't haven't been touched since the 70s, so it's time for a renewal of those. Uh, the need for better connectivity, so again, very large block sizes without uh, much internal access to, to the internal areas of blocks, so that makes things challenging like garbage collection and emergency service access. We know the, the ambulance hates getting calls there because it takes them forever to find units because there's no, um, no uh, vehicular access, so they're kind of walking down lanes trying to find, uh, trying to find the addresses. Um, limited socioeconomic mix, so with 501 rent geared to income units, it's a high concentration of low-income households. Uh, and, and that exacerbates the challenges. And an interesting point of that, um, when we started our project, we weren't sure if, uh, if how would that would be received in terms of uh, proposing to to change the socioeconomic mix in the neighborhood by bringing in some market housing. And it was really strongly supported that that folks said yes, uh, we we want to live in a more uh, socially uh, mixed community. Um, and so just a general idea that there's a need for a, a quality of life improvement in the community. So the study goals, so um, to improve housing and public spaces and community amenities, spearhead asset renewal through new funding streams such as land sales. So we do have some sites uh, in the neighborhood that will be sold off to the private sector to bring in some of that market housing component. Um, but we know this isn't downtown Toronto, so those land values are going to be low. It's not going to be a, a lot of money injected to the project here. Uh, introducing a greater demographic mix by introducing market housing and relocating some subsidized units. So we have uh, the result of the plan is to move out 100 units. So we're going to re recreate 100 units elsewhere in the city uh, for these RGI units that we've lost. So we have uh, folks from Ontario will know there's a service level standards for uh, housing jurisdictions here that we have to maintain. So we have a requirement to maintain a certain number. So we just can't get rid of them. We have to replace them. So we're going to distribute them across the city. Um, improve neighborhood layout to improve safety. So those are those items that I were talking about with uh, the need for a better connectivity that's, that has uh, good sight lines and surveillance opportunities. Um, align the neighborhood with the centralized waiting list of demographics and demand. So at the time when these public housing units were built, it was primarily families, uh, low-income families for the, the target group. So a lot of t townhouses, so uh, three, four, five bedroom units were built, but now our wait list demand is 60% uh, singles, so for one bedrooms or bachelors, so we have a, a big mismatch there. So our singles end up waiting six to eight years, whereas families are getting housed much quicker. So units that we're recreating, we're, we're replacing uh, with one bedroom units to meet that demand. Um, support community development through an inclusive consultation process. So um, consultation was key here. We're, we're dealing with an existing community, renovating an existing community, so we've got people with real lives and, and connection to the area, so we need to involve them to get uh, get some buy-in, but also to improve the, the end product, and to develop a realistic business and phasing plan. So it's going to be costly to rebuild and do these types of renovations, so staggering it over a, a long period of time. Uh, we, we call this, it's a 20-plus year plan, so um, over, a, over a longer period of time, we can the costs are, are more manageable. So public engagement, like I said, um, <clears throat> we, so we, we did hire a consultant team led by uh, a planning and design firm, and they had uh, a variety of sub-consultants on for, for the technical work. Um, so in our public engagement component, uh, 
we, we went out and you know asked the standard types of questions what do you value in your community what would you like to see change so here's some of the the ideas that came out of the what you value question and people are uh, value their neighbors and the trees and the sense of community um, the splash pad was a was a small neighborhood project completed years uh, previously and and had a lot of support you can see a picture of that in the bottom had a lot of support and, and sort of community built around it because the actual the community was involved in building it so that was an interesting lesson that we took away that involving community is key to get that sense of ownership and and people will take care of, of, of these amenities over time um, when we asked the question um, what would you like to change in your community uh, th these are the types of issues that came up so uh, better and more play structures, so it's very dated park spaces. Um, garbage, uh, dirty, unclean, so there's a big challenge in the neighborhood with garbage collection because we've got tiers of townhouses, uh, sometimes four deep, so you can be pretty distant from a road uh, for garbage collection, so uh, garbage collection day is, is mayhem out there, so we've got a, a part of our plan, as you'll see, is to bring um, front door access for t to every unit. Uh, drug drug dealing is a big issue. Um, not enough activities for kids. Uh, more activities for teens. The conditions of the building, some of them are, are ch challenging. Um, lower utility costs, so these these buildings need some uh, envelope improvements for insulating and and those sorts of things. Um, and more stores close by, so um, there's a limited amount of commercial. Um, uses right nearby or, or right accessible but the quarry that I mentioned early on that forms a barrier with a, a major commercial area so um, getting folks down there is also a, an objective for the project so out of the um, the consultation part we developed these these principles of regeneration so this was really our our commitment to the community that we've heard but you've said these are the the um, principles that we we uh, intend the plan to adhere to it so at the end of the day we're we're reflecting back to the community what we heard from them so these are just really quickly each one had kind of had a paragraph that went along with it but to create an affordable and safe healthy community connect the community so that that physical connection so um, uh, vehicular access uh, uh, and connections out of the community um, supporting the community so a low-income uh, community that needs uh, supports uh, employment supports uh, it could be could be food programs, these sorts of things. Enhancing park spaces and uh, public public spaces. Um, getting the little things right is something we heard about too. Um, so while we were talking about big changes like new streets and ch renovating parks, they were thinking about more immediate needs like um, uh, it might be drafty windows or something like that. Um, build trust through visible success. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion in this neighborhood for. 10, 15, 20 years about the need for improvements, but um, not a lot had happened. So there's there's lack of trust. So we spent a lot of time um, doing the consultation exercises to really get that trust built, and we're trying to stay in touch with people now to keep them informed, to keep that trust uh, going, and achievable, realistic planning. So again, um, while we have this big, great plan for the neighborhood, um, uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, things on a daily basis were were working well, and we were continuing to address those matters. So the consultant team looked at the neighborhood. They looked at our building condition assessments. So that's the, the, the assessments of the physical properties themselves. And they said um, that the properties, there's some of them that uh, need, need uh, can be maintained and don't need too much investment, but uh, a number of the properties need, as you can see there, uh, more investment required. So there's a um, capital improvement uh, question there, a lot, of, a lot of funding needed just to maintain the existing structures. Um, looking at the the circulation patterns within the neighborhood too. This is the uh, shows the streets and, and pedestrian pathways, and you can see the blocks of, are, are quite big that are defined by the, the street network. And in a regular neighborhood, you'd ha you'd have these bigger blocks split up by multiple streets. So that's uh, one of the one of the challenges that we identified. And for the park spaces too, you can see there's a generous amount of park space, but uh, they're unprogrammed. Um, because of the history piece, but also um, usage in these parks is quite limited. You can see the the, the uh, zigzag line. Um, it says it's existing barrier to proper sight line. So all these parks are backlotted. So they've got houses backing onto them, and then that makes a real challenge for for usage. Um, we, usage is quite low because people can't be seen. They, they don't feel safe in these areas because when challenges do happen, um, nobody sees it, and there's not intervention. So uh, that was also big a big uh, challenge 
Um, so the key findings of, of the analysis uh, was the high concentration of public housing units, um, the uh, neighborhood design challenges, so um, the current neighborhood design is arranged in a manner that creates operational safety and security challenges, so operational, we can't pick up garbage, safety and security is more about the residents' day-to-day uh, -day life and um, the challenges with the, the hidden areas and the, and the pathways and these sorts of things that become unsafe. And then the, the idea of mixed housing, so the revitalization of the neighborhood should seek to introduce a mix of private, so market housing in the neighborhood, and relocate some of the public housing units to other areas of the city. So that was uh, the sort of the end, end of our analysis phase. So we, we did we were looking at um, sewer capacity and stormwater and these sorts of things um, as well. Uh, but this is kind of the uh, the synopsis of that. So this is here shows the neighborhood um, when we when we started the project. Uh, you can see the large park spaces and um, grab my highlighter again if I can here and show you some of these blocks here in this area. You can see that they're, they're backing onto parks and. You might think that looks uh, looks like an opportunity, but really these parks are unprogrammed. And for these units back here, the, from hearing from the parents, they don't like their kids out in these areas because it's it's broken glass, it's um, and, and all other sorts of, of um, safety and security concerns related to behaviors and things that go on in the neighborhood. So, um, and you can see that all the blocks have that, right? So, um, Onto the next slide here. So here's the plan that was uh, that was adopted by council, that uh, now includes um, new public streets through those former uh, blank park spaces and and reconciled park spaces with more uh, planned uh, programming. Um, so here another new public street here providing frontage for these new market townhouses uh, looking into the park. So um, we've created a, a lot more frontage. You can see along this street here, we used to have, uh, right here there was a property with 30 um, of the oldest social housing units and those got uh, demolished uh, early on when we were working through this. Uh, the, the parks group was going through a park redesign, redevelopment for this and we said, hey, you know, one of the biggest challenges here is the, uh, the uh, sight lines into parks and we have a, a block of housing in this area that's uh, impacting that and it's our some of our oldest housing and we know we're going to get rid of some so this would be a good place to start. So um, that park's actually under development right now. I've got a slide on that coming up. But So this is our plan. So you can see um, new private lanes coming in providing frontage to units, new public streets, uh, reconciled park spaces um, to provide uh, appropriate sized parks. Um, and, and in, this, in, this, in the size that we can actually put some programming in. So here's, uh, sh this shows the new circulation pattern. So the new public streets are in red, uh, private lanes are in, in blue. So now all of those units that were in, in behind now are, are in front now relative to their, to their lane or their street, whichever it is they have for access. So how were the community needs addressed? So the aging and poor housing stock, so the Kingston Phronic Housing Corporation, that's the acronym, will have renovated or replaced units. Lack of security and safety, um, housing entrances will now be onto streets rather than back in behind multiple rows of townhouses. New streets with, will have active uses and better sight lines. There'll be new paths through the neighborhood parks with lighting, uh, new programming in parks. Uh, the un unprogrammed and underutilized park spaces, so reconfiguration of parkland, more programming, uh, the introduction of streets and paths, um, and proper entrances to the parks, and improved stormwater management. So um, one of the, the major park there, um, Shannon Park, is, is one that floods every year. So uh, there's um, a new uh, new uh, grade, regrading in that park and new stormwater treatments to make it so every spring we don't have that park flooding. Um, high energy costs, so of course uh, part of the affordable housing is um, is, is utility costs, right? So in some cases, we've got people paying more for their utility than for their, their monthly rent. So um, definitely there's units in need of uh, envelope improvements, insulation, and um, so, so older units need to be renovated and new units, we need to build energy efficient ones. And for those of you in housing, today's uh, National Housing Day, and I see there's a bunch of announcements um, coming coming out through the email here about uh, new funding for, for renovating existing housing stock and rebuilding. So um, you'll probably be hearing that in your community, so there'll be lots of excitement in housing for sure. 
Um, other issues, so uh, garbage collection and neighborhood cleanliness. So all of these townhouse units now are going to have front door access, which is which is really important. Uh, the need for better connectivity. So we've got new streets, private laneways, and, and new uh, clearly defined public pathways. Um, the the quarry too that I pointed out. That's a really solid physical barrier to get down to the commercial area along uh, Division Street. Uh, it's kind of a developing regional commercial hub, and although folks are within uh, a few hundred meters of that area, it's really difficult to get down there. So we've been actually working with a private landowner, uh, actually a couple private landowners, to to secure a new pathway, a pedestrian pathway down to the commercial area. So that's um, been interesting and, and kind of one of those things that, that comes along. And, and as the quarry is being redeveloped now with a commercial uh, plaza, um, we're, we're hopeful that that actually comes to fruition because it'll make a, a huge change for a lot of people. Um, uh, long service area waiting list. So like I said, we've got 60% of our demand is for one bedroom, but most of our supply is family units, so we're transitioning more towards that uh, single occupant demographic and creating a mixed income sustainable community. So re we're relocating some of the public housing units out, so we're going to distribute them more evenly around the city and we're going to introduce market housing options. So at the end of the day, on these, all the land that we're working with, uh, we have 501 units. At the end of the day, the uh, social housing mix will be down only to about uh, 50%, so uh, a more healthy mix there. Um, so where we are at today, so this is uh, Shannon Park. This is the phase one component of the project. So um, this is the new extended uh, public street through the park, so uh, to address that concerns about um, limited surveillance and, and safety within the parks and new housing block here, so homes fronting onto that park will create a much more public uh, public feel to the space rather than uh, a park that with houses just backing onto it, which creates a very um, insecure type of feeling. Um, the new community center is currently under construction opening. I've got a, a plan for that to show you shortly here. Um, a skate park, a new skate park, it's the biggest one in Kingston, opened um, in the in the springtime, and so that's been very exciting. So this, yeah, this whole park is getting uh, revamped, which is which is going to be really big for a community that hasn't really seen a lot of change in, in a fair number of years. Um, over to the headway block. So this is um, getting over towards the quarry, if you can recall that from the beginning. So this is um, a conceptual plan that we're working uh, with some consultants to get development approvals to pursue. So the yellow units are existing and the orange units are infill, and you can see the two orange apartment buildings uh, infill as well. Um, we might not build it out exactly like this, but this is kind of the concept to show what's um, available to, to do in terms of infill units, but the new public street and the private laneway system is something that we are committed to, to constructing because it, it crosses off so many, um, so many challenges on that list, so, so everything from the garbage collection piece, so right now, um, the, uh, the the housing provider here spends two hundred thousand dollars a year on private garbage collection, so that's above and beyond what the municipality picks up. Um, it's just that unorganized that um, there's just so much waste on the properties that they're spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to address that. So um, these new public lanes will bring in uh, front door garbage collection, and we're hoping that addresses that challenge. There's also though the, the concern from police who, who can't uh, access units, um, ambulances taking a fair bit of time to access a unit that's hidden in behind right now. So they'll be able to actually have, these private lanes will have names and, and they'll have street numbers and that sort of thing. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And just the uh, casual surveillance of cars driving up and down, police being able to drive up and down, uh, will, will change the dynamic here greatly. So this is a, an example of, of that, uh, the challenge. So this is the parking area here. These are the footprints of the existing townhouses. So you can see if uh, you're living back here or in this area, it's it's pretty um, pretty secluded area in, in the negative sense. And then over on the right, you can see with the, the private laneways that will come in here and here, uh, it'll make it a much more public feel to the space. And we're also moving parking areas uh, currently are over here and here. And so um, lots of vehicle break-ins and that because there's no one looking onto it and it's kind of separated from the housing areas, so bringing them into a more traditional townhouse pattern with uh, parking areas in, in the rear yards. 
Here's a picture of a, a small parkette that was created in partnership with the, uh, the a health center that opened in the neighborhood. So um, uh, this basketball net and, and uh, just some seating in, in, the, in this parkette, uh, very well used. It's got um, the commercial plaza on two sides and then road frontage on two other sides. So it's interesting to see uh, in an evening. We're seeing a lot of youth uh, uh, congregating here, uh, being active. It's great. And they have those much larger other park spaces that are all have the, are all backlotted, and um, nobody's really using those spaces. So we've got a much smaller space um, from a square footage perspective that gets a lot of use versus uh, areas much bigger that that get limited use. So um, that's that's an important important lesson that we've been trying to implement here. Um, this is a shot of the new skate park as well. On the opening, you can see all the kids here. Um, this is. Uh, a local community group worked on this. There's a lot of fundraising that was done, and um, so so it worked really well. It was a partnership with the city. It's the biggest skate park in Kingston, and, and this summer it was um, very very active, very packed. So it's it's great to see that this resource provided for the community because um, it's it's so important to have some local recreation opportunities because a lot of these folks don't have vehicles to drive their kids across the city to to different uh, parks or different facilities like like uh, other folks would, so that's very exciting. This is a floor plan here for the community center, so it's actually getting very close to completion, which is exciting. So um, with my pointer here, this is the Rideau Heights Public School, and uh, so this is a partnership with the city built on the uh, school board's land, but the city is, is building this. Um, so the school will actually connect via this hallway into this new um, community center with a, a library uh, uh, branch here, um, youth and senior program spaces, so Wi-Fi and computers, kind of a lounge space that can be booked or more informally used uh, just for drop-in activities. A full-size gymnasium, um, uh, kind of a commercial-style kitchen where uh, cooking classes will be taught or it can be used for catering for events that are hosted in this large gathering space. There's a small sound recording studio which was uh, identified as working with the neighborhood is something that they'd, they'd like to see and would be um, used. Another interesting thing, if anyone is involved in um, emergency uh, management in the municipalities, this has also been designed to be our facility if we ever have to host um, an evacuation center and, and host people overnight, so with, with cots. and So we've got washrooms and, and shower facilities and all those sorts of things. So um, that's also uh, uh, kind of unique for this as well. So lessons learned, um, <clears throat> uh, lots of lessons, but the few that came to mind quickly for me was the public engagement piece. So um, it's important to take it to a higher level of effort when renovating in an existing community. So we're dealing with uh, existing households, real people's lives. So um, it's, uh, I think as, as municipal staff and sometimes in development, it's, uh, we, we focus more on the, on the hard, uh, on the bricks and mortar, but we really worked hard on that engagement piece here because um, it, it can blow up in your face really quickly. So um, that's that's something we, we took away and we share with others. Um, and the public engagement needs to be considerate of communities' needs and preferences. So um, my background's in planning, you know, I've done consultations in, in lots of neighborhoods, but never really uh, a lower income neighborhood like this. So things, uh, we had to do things slightly differently. You don't just put up a sign and advertise, um, uh, we're, we're changing a whole bunch of things in your neighborhood, and we're going to have a public meeting to talk about it because uh, nobody nobody shows up. So, um, we it, whereas if you did that in in another maybe a owner occupied type of neighborhood, you, you'd probably get some good turnout and you'd get lots of lots of angry folks. But um, we we uh, some of our strategies were to piggyback on other events. So we'd show up at the farmers market um, with a booth and talking to folks, or we'd show up at the Salvation Army's uh, monthly meals that they provide at the end of the month when. Um, when people are generally low on funds, so we were we were getting getting in front of folks at places where they tend to um, tend to interact already. Um, another lesson: the short-sighted design can have long-term negative implications. So, uh, so the design of these neighborhoods back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, uh, uh, details of those designs resulted directly in um, very costly. Uh, things for us now. So this the high annual vacancy. So when we started this project, the vacancy rate was around 38% uh, each year. So 38 
percent of those units were flipping. So a huge cost, right? To you've got vacancy lost, you've got uh, renovation costs to get them back up to a rentable state. So um, we've seen that already going down just with some of the projects and with with just some of the sense that something's changing in the neighborhood. We're seeing that vacancy rate come down, so that's going to save money. Um, private garbage collection too. I mentioned there's about two hundred thousand dollars spent each year uh, on the private garbage pickup, so to contractors. So we're hoping that gets addressed. And uh, there's a number of others, but uh, also the quality of life piece. So um, people are optimistic, whereas in this neighborhood and the stigma, the attitudes have been very negative, but there's a real optimism developing there. So so that's great. Um, and I, another interesting one for us, and maybe for the people, sociologists, folks, is the social housing communities want socioeconomic diversity. So um, that was kind of a touchy subject for us, you know, about bringing in new market housing and, and changing the mix a bit. And, and really a, a, around all the tables we've sat with, people said, yeah, hey, that's a great idea. We want we want that for sure. So so that was uh, an interesting lesson. But um, that's the end. Uh, I could talk, uh, of course, for hours about this project, but that's the end of my formal presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, John. That's a really, really yeah. interesting presentation. I uh, definitely found it very interesting. Um, so we have a couple of questions. So the first one uh, from Tara is about um, the design of the new houses that are going to be built. Are you planning on incorporating um, passive solar or distributive energy generation or energy efficiency strategies into the housing design? Um, <clears throat> we have. The, the master plan recommended looking at a, a district um, heating system uh, for it, for the neighborhood, but um, uh, we haven't done the the uh, economic modeling on that to see if it if it makes sense. A lot of times, in affordable housing, um, uh, we're we're pushed to uh, and there's interest to do lots of uh, creative, um, cutting edge types of things. But often we're find uh, just challenging enough just to to to, to put these buildings together uh, and and having that long term. Um, sight on uh, the potential savings can be challenging sometimes. So that's a so that's a real balancing act where where the, the costs just to build a unit are, are substantial and, so, and going with traditional um, uh, systems is sometimes the, the default. But yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to move towards more um, looking at, at these other opportunities. Yeah, definitely a challenge um, for anyone trying to do innovative things, especially mm -hmm. in public government. Mm -hmm. um, the second question, again from, from Tara, is um, are you able to employ local people or encourage contractors to employ people from the neighborhood in the regeneration work? We want to. Um, that's been something that's been done, and if anybody's interested in that, you can look in um, in, in Regent Park in Toronto, where the Toronto um, uh, the Housing Corporation of Toronto required contractors working um, to a higher percentage of of residents. So definitely something um, very interesting, and we'll. Uh, we're, we're going to look at that for sure. Great. Um, a third question. So it sounds like you've, uh, this is from Sarah Harrison. So it, it sounds like you've experienced a number of challenges with poorly planned, uh, more pedestrian based community. Um, so the challenges with the garbage collection or the ambulances or the police. Um, do you have any comments on bal balancing access with uh, building less car dependent communities for the future? Um, yeah, I'm just reading that here. I, uh, nothing is jumping. Like it's, that's a really good question. Um, I'm thinking. Uh, really, it's thinking about um, some of those good neighborhood design uh, things, like like what what's the size of your blocks? Um, uh, are, are you do your units have proper frontage? Um, these types of things. So um, these obviously these this, these housing blocks were built from, with a pedestrian focus, but at the same time. Uh, it created um, a lot of of hidden areas and areas that were uh, distant from public space, like a street or an actively used park. So, uh, and you can see that all over. If you go, uh, if you look at the Regent Park or Alexander Park, those are great examples where um, uh, the plans have s new streets and laneways in them. So a lot of the time. Um, we're talking about trying to reduce the, the amount of street surfaces and, and these sorts of things, but in um, social housing neighborhoods that were built at this time, the, the connectivity piece um, was not considered, so they're often cut off from neighborhoods. So um, I have some example slides that I was going to include to try to illustrate this, but I thought I had too much. But, it, but yeah, if you compare a lot of the plans, all of a sudden you're going to see these new street connections going through um, these neighborhoods that were previously 
pedestrian focus. So pedestrian focus, I think, uh, very important, but you don't want to lose sight of the fact that um, if it's only pedestrian access, you're going to lose access for um, for important services and, and also that whole safety issue as well. Very, very interesting uh, challenge there. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question was regard, uh, regarding transit. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you're doing specifically to um, increase transit uh, use by, by community members. Sure, yeah, from a design perspective. So um, there's a new high-frequency transit service along Division Street, which is that main artery from Rideau Heights to the downtown, if you can remember back to the first slide. But uh, that quarry limits people's ability to walk down to that express transit stop. So there's, it's a big it's a big route to go around. So really, we're we're really focused uh, on, on getting that pathway that I mentioned that would go down through that newly developed commercial area in the quarry, and then feed over into the um, in, into the Division Street corridor where there'd be express transit service. So so getting that that is key. Um, so that's from a design perspective, but from uh, sort of from the on the, the programming side of it, uh, the city has recently, uh, we're piloting a, a project where all uh, Ontario Works, so that's our social assistance program in Ontario, where all uh, Ontario Works clients get a free bus pass. So, um, so which is pretty big because uh, for folks getting around town, whether it's to their appointments or to maybe to their work or to interviews and these sorts of things, um, it's uh, it's been a pretty uh, pretty important step. So. Um, getting yeah, getting a bus bus pass in people's hands and and making sure that the the express express transit route that's actually there and running is is accessible to folks uh, walking walking down to the bus bus route. 